The history of the Queen Bee uh, starts with the birth of a new town. Hurrah City was a village that was closer to where the, the KCS railroad tracks are now. Um, there was only one actual building and it was the the uh, the DeHorse Hotel. Um, all of the other buildings weren't buildings, they were tents. And so it was a tent city. It was more of a mining town at that time, but then came the railroad. Um, an idea spawned by Arthur Stilwell. He, uh, he was able to start at Kansas City and start down this way toward the Gulf of Mexico with the, with the railroad. And the railroad came through this little tent city called Hurrah City. Well, because of the railroad coming through De Queen or Hurrah City at the time, uh, they wanted to name this a town somewhere on this this railroad line after one of the big entrepreneurs that financed the railroad, and his name was Jan de Wien, and he was from Amsterdam, Holland. Well, when they wanted to name the town, they couldn't pronounce his name and they couldn't spell it, so they wound up. Americanizing the name, and that became the birth of De Queen. And, uh, and I believe it was born about June 3rd, 1897. But very soon after, uh, maybe a day later, the De Queen Bee was, was born also. So the De Queen Bee is one of our oldest establishments, and we're very proud of it. It's, go it's gone through so much, um, so much change over the years, some progress. Um, it just, the, the newspaper meant a lot to the people of those days because there was no other way to get any any information. I started taking the bee full time and uh, the citizens, as soon as it became available when they started publishing it every day. I, but I started taking the bee, I think in 1952 or three, just right after I came back here. And uh, from that time till they closed it, I, I took it continuously. And uh, it was something we looked forward to every day. As, you know, I can remember driving around by the courthouse square some evening, there'd be two or three, four people standing out there to stand in front of the B office waiting for the paper to come out. I mean, that people were, they, they were informed by it. Mm. Newspaper has been an important part of my life. All the way through uh, my time here on Earth, uh, I enjoyed reading the paper and I know we have all of the iPhones and so forth today that you can read history and what have you on, but I still enjoy reading a newspaper, taking my time and going through the different articles. beginning of this brand new newspaper. This newspaper was just an idea. It was a dream of a, a new opportunity by Walter Boyd, who was a printer, and J.W. Bishop, who was a lawyer from Nashville, Arkansas. The story goes that these two men, sensing a business opportunity, decided to start a newspaper in the new town of DeQueen and call it the DeQueen Bee. Um, you know, it's a great institution. The name is unique and we used to get inquiries from all over the country from people wanting to know about the name, the Queen Bee. And Ray Kimball told me, um, I asked him about the origin of the name, and he said the newspaper was founded by two guys named Bishop and Boyd who were over in Nashville at the time, and they heard the um, railroad was going to come through well, where the Queen is now, and, and um, they said, um, well, that sounds like a good place to put in a newspaper, and one of them so what do we call it? And the other one said the Queen Bee. And so that's kind of how the name, that's the legend I was told how the name began. Sounds reasonable. This paper was to be published every Friday. We get it now on Thursday, but it was on Friday for quite a while. And the price of a subscription was, get this, $1 a year. Printing material uh, was hauled 
here from Horatio in a lumber wagon by Walter Boyd. And For some was, reason, they only printed three issues of this paper before they sold the paper to E.C. Winford. During the first several months, it was owned at various times by Mr. Winford, um, A.T. Evans, L.A. Pierre, James L. Cannon, and then O.T. Graves. I mean, a lot of people got their finger in the pot there. Cannon and Graves published the paper until 1899. And this is what a lot of people don't know. There was a big fire that destroyed most of the business portion of the new town of Dequeen, including that B office. But the morning after that big fire, we call it the big fire, a sign was hung on the lot where the B office had stood, which read, the B will appear this week as usual. And it sure did. That what they did, they set the type in Winthrop, Arkansas, and the edition was printed uh, on an old Washington, uh, a hand press in old Washington between 3 and 4 a.m. They got the papers in on the train. The papers were folded on the train depot platform, and then the mailing list was addressed on the caboose of the freight train. Papers were mailed on time. in the 1800s and the early 1900s were just, the pictures in the papers were just drawn by graphic artists. Uh, they provided drawings in the B until 1905. And then in 1905, the first actual pictures were printed, June 2nd, 1905, an actual real picture. In 1932, when Ramsey sold half interest in the Sevier County Citizen to Ray Kimball, later that year, his dad, a, I believe it was his da dad, A.L. Kimball continued or discontinued his Horatio Times paper and purchased Ramsey's remaining interest in the citizen and moved everything to Dequeen. Then Ray and A.L. Kimball purchased the weekly Dequeen Bee in May of the, 1933 and combined it with the citizen, which became our daily paper known as the Dequeen Daily Citizen. Mr. Kimball, uh, when he was there, when he was a World War II veteran also, and he uh, left and went to the war, and when he came back, you know, I, it was kind of understood that uh, he had asked the local merchants if they would support a daily newspaper, and that time they said, yes, they would. So I think we kept the daily on for a long time, even though it probably was not practical. You know, uh, it's just not... Me personally, I thought it was great back then. Uh, you know, being from a small town like that and having a newspaper, put a picture or so maybe sometimes around, things like that. It, it was uh, very interesting and humbling, you might say. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, people really looked forward to it. And it would, you know, you meet somebody on the street, I saw your picture in the paper the other day about so-and-so. And, -so, and that was a route of conversation for a lot of people. And, uh, it's just been an institution, I'd say, since 1950, the B and the Citizen to, to boot. Media, you know, we had the, the Queen Daily Citizen, which published Monday through Friday, and then uh, the news um, from the previous week, we would repackage it and uh, print it in the Queen B, a weekly paper that mostly went to people out in the country and uh, people who had moved away and wanted to keep a subscription and keep a connection with the local town. So the, the people around town mostly got the Dequeen Daily Citizen. 
It was a print product. It was a very busy place. It took a lot of work to get all that packaged, printed, and delivered um, in a, on a daily basis. Uh, to me, it was delivered, I think, or received almost countywide back in the early 50s and 60s along there, and people just truly looked forward to it. It was uh, their way of information for the local area. was here since World War II and before, I believe. He and his father um, uh, were in the newspaper business here. Um, I think started in Horatio and then eventually moved to the Queen when there were a lot of little newspapers around. You know, they got gradually all consolidated and, and they ended up into Queen. But Mr. Kimball was known for being a fan of technology. He liked new equipment and new stuff. And, um, you know, now you probably have a, personal computer that you use most of the day. But back in the day, um, we had a, a, a terminal, but it went to a storage device in the back and a, we had uh, uh, copy graphic equipment. It was expensive to buy and it used uh, photographic film to set type. And so all that cost a lot to do, you know. I mean, he was always wanting to get into the uh, to the newer stuff because the newer was better. And then the PC came along, we got into the Mac side of the PC world. And um, we, uh, I remember the first Mac we ever bought was a little bitty thing, had a nine inch screen and we didn't know what, what it could do, you know. It ended up, um, started out managing a subscription list, you know, and then gradually we got to where we could compose type using the Mac and, and set it on a, a uh, laser printer or uh, some other device in the back. Mr. Kimball treated us just like we were one of his kids, really. He just... Mm -hmm. That's so true. He just... He was always concerned about what was wrong with us, if something was wrong, or or he was happy for us if we were happy. And, and um, it was a, a good atmosphere. He was a very good man probably the best I've ever known. Sir, if something father. was wrong with you or you had a problem, he's going to be there to help you through it. Vice man you'd meet, it just, and community minded, if it was a community project that needed pushing, he pushed it. <laughs> Ray Kimball was a very well educated man, cared for his community, cared for his employees, treated them like family. They weren't just employees to him. And um, it was just a great environment. He was a great man to work for. Mr. Kipple was the type of person that wanted the best for his community and, and everyone. He worked hard to, to give us a work environment that had the most up-to-date equipment, computers, whatever it was. He would go to a convention and you knew when he came back he'd have something new. And um, he, he was just really a wonderful man. He is the most important part of the college and the community. I mean, the state. I mean, it goes on and on. I mean, Guy was in broadcasting for 70 something years. And I mean, won every award you can win. You know, back in, you know, this this is, you know, not way before my time, but when, um, you know, when they started talking about building uh, dams on these reservoirs, 
uh, or the rivers around yeah. here. Yeah. The Corps of Engineers, they were going to build one dam, and that was Millwood. Well, Ray, I mean, not single-handedly, but he was the one that pushed uh, to have dams built on DeQueen to make DeQueen Lake, to make Dirks Lake, and Gillum Lakes. Ray Kimball did that. I mean, he was the guy that that, that, that really had the, you know, the uh, foresight to to really say, hey, you know, we we this is something we have to do, and I think that's a story about Ray Kimball that a lot of people just they they either don't remember it or just it wasn't a big deal to some people. There's no telling how many acres of farmland that Ray Kimball is responsible for saving because of floods and flood control. And just something that you you really don't think about, but I mean that's you know kind of what happened. So, you know, Ray was Mr. DeQueen. I mean, he was. I mean, he won that award back in the 1980s. Uh, you know, I've been here since the 1970s, but I you know I remember he was you know named like Mr. DeQueen. That was on the 50th anniversary of the DeQueen Chamber um, banquets, I guess. But you know he won that, and this college. I'm not quite sure the college would would be here if it wasn't for Ray and Evelyn, his wife. I mean, because you know the Kimball Library on this campus, you know, it's named it's named the Kimball Library, but it's actually named after Ray and Evelyn. You know, both of them, and it, not necessarily so much from from monetary donations, although you know they they obviously gave their time and and money and everything else. But you know, Ray Kimball, he was. He was the guy who called uh, Governor Dale Bumpers at that time, 1973, and said, hey, wait a minute. You know, I, I noticed that you're putting a Votech in Mina. You know, we need a Votech. You know, th- you know that, that's too far of a drive for people in Horatio and, 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 and you know, Locksburg and DeQueen. He said, we need a Votech here in DeQueen. And, and, and so I'm not sure the college would be here if it wasn't for that phone call. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it has Ray Kimball's fingerprints all over it. I mean, it just does. I mean, that's what, that's what he did. But uh, I mean, Ray was just, um, he, he just did a lot of great things, not just for the college, but for our community. That's where all the gangsters were. And you, you hear about Dillinger and, and all the gangsters that were going on. And, and the, the FBI wasn't known as the FBI at that time. But it became the FBI. And they were hunting the most wanted people of the United States in the, in the country. Well, we had some of those people right here in this area. And the DeQueen Daily Citizen paper, the DeQueen Daily paper, covered that to an extreme for instance, August 13th, 1938, here's the headlines. Hamilton Walters hunted near Kim. Arrest of pair believed imminent as state troopers fired on car. And then on the August 15th, 1938, the hunt for Hamilton and Walters in the Sevier County area continued by officers. The pair of bandits believed still in the Costa vicinity. Well, here's the story. The bandits were flushed at the lab bridge on the day after they robbed the Coca-Cola Bottling Company at Nashville. And they fled to near Wilton, Arkansas, where they took a car from T.H. Fuel. He was a Texarkana salesman of undertaker supplies, and then they abandoned the stolen car in which they were fleeing. Prior to taking the fuel car, they had fired on a mail truck driven by Dick Wright, who escaped by stepping on the gas and turning into a side road. they had a gun battle with Sheriff Jim Sanderson near, near Wilton, uh, and little had been seen of them, but people knew that they uh, had a hideout at one time, and they knew all about the area up by Land Bridge on, off the Costop River. 
So that's where they started uh, their main hunt, was going up there and looking for them. But they heard that car coming across that bridge, and they figured it was them. And they were in the casket salesman's car that they had stolen, and they opened fire on this car with everything they had. Well, guess what? The, 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 two, the two guys, uh, Hamilton and Walters, jumped off the, the bridge, 10 foot down and ran into the woods. They even, uh, to hunt these guys, they even got a bloodhound from the McAllister, Oklahoma Penitentiary. He was named Old Boston, and they brought him in to try to track these guys down. They, and they looked uh, along the railroad tracks, thinking they would catch a train, which they did. But they came to the Queen, Arkansas. Through, they came through the woods and wound up into Queen, Arkansas. And somewhere around the Queen, they caught a train and wound up in Dallas, Texas, where they were eventually captured. The Daily Citizen was not printed during World War II, and there was talk about not resuming it, but Ray Campbell, once again, worked to get the support of local businesses, and then beginning in 1946, the DeQueen Bee Company published both papers. Then in 1952, going up in time, J.R. McKinley, many of you remember J.R., joined the papers as the editor. I came here, I relocated from Malvern, I was the editor of the Malvern Daily Record and uh, the daily newspaper in Malvern, Arkansas. And uh, so I was recruited to come here and uh, uh, take over when J.R. McKinley, who was the editor before me, he was ready to retire. So, uh, so I came into J.R. McKinley's place. J.R. was probably here since the early 60s. He um, had a great interest in sports. And so when I came, he kind of stepped back and he did some sports writing for a few years and then eventually retired altogether. J.R. was a World War II native and married a, uh, uh, a woman from England. And she moved here after World War II and they lived in the Queen from, I'm not sure, probably early 60s until, um, until he died. Uh, one of the people down at the newspaper, the, one of the editors, uh, was J.R. McKinley, who was, I had different uh, positions with the paper. I imagine he wrote a lot of different articles, but he was really big in sports, very good at it. And both of his sons played uh, football with me, and I graduated out of high school in 1965. And we, uh, he was always on top of everything as far as sports and being able to uh, bring it forward about the kids that were coming up through the junior high period of time into the high school and what he thought, uh, how good of players that they would be and so forth. And uh, he usually was correct. Uh, J.R. came from a little town over in Oklahoma. He moved to the Queen. And, and, uh, raised his family here and was uh, an asset to the community as far as newspaper and us uh, 
you know, being able to obtain, obtain the news that we needed to get during that period of time. And he, he covered our sports like, I mean, track was his big thing, but he covered the others too really well, but track, oh, he was just so, he started basically our track program at the Queen High School. And uh, he, he was a great man for the community because he was very involved and he covered everything that he could. And, he, and then he had two or three people in the office there. He could get him to help him from time to time. And uh, they, they covered it, I thought, excellent. I was born in 1948, and of course in the mid 50s, late 50s, I was my first, uh, prior to uh, that time, I I basically say the start of me being familiar with papers was in Little League Baseball. And what just so happened that uh, J.R. McKinley, who was editor at that time, uh, worked all the Little League games. You would see him uh, taking notes and stats and by the articles about the Little League Baseball, J.R. could take a uh, newspaper pad and pencil when he didn't even have a stat book and take everything down, including later on he would do it in, even in the football games at D. Queen. So I knew J.R. would take that information firsthand, go back and publish it. It was very important to all the young youth and parents of youth. Uh, the Queen Bee has been something that has been very important to me since probably the age of eight or ten years old. I used to play baseball and looked forward to seeing anything that was in the newspaper about any kind of sports. And my parents read the paper. We had a daily paper here then, and it was something that you just couldn't wait to get the newspaper at the end of the day. Boy, sports editor was a boy by the name of Dwayne Bunch, who, who was a little but uh, about two or three, four years older than I was, so he had come back to the bee to work, and he was the sports editor, so he, he probably made that picture right there at his desk. And I, know he, I know he made these articles there. I'm sure he even got a byline on some of it, but uh, Bunch was his last name, and uh, then they had uh, a boy by the name of Scott Smith, and he covered the sports. So, like I say, the paper had just been excellent for the community, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, we always look forward to seeing the bee come out after our football, basketball, baseball games because that was the thing in Dequeen at the time to play sports. Uh, had so many friends that played sports, but I was Dequeen's quarterback from in 1970, 71 and 72. Uh, we, we had a couple of good, good years, one or two average years, but uh, I enjoyed playing and we always look forward to the bee coming out after our ball games to read about if we won or lost or who scored or uh, what our record was and just how proud we were to be recognized in the town and everybody knew us, uh, everybody knew who, what we played and uh, it was just uh, an amazing thing to read about yourself in the bee and your friends too, and your coaches and the fans. It was just a, a, a wonderful time to be in, in high school at DeQueen. I was raised in Locksburg, Arkansas, and, and, and we always, you know, um, played basketball. You know, we were pretty good at it. 
But I know that that was something that our families looked forward to. It really was. I mean, our families looked forward to uh, either seeing our names in the in, in the bee or our pictures in the bee, you know, because they always had a photographer, you know, that was there to cover all, you know, not just the Locksburg games. I mean, my personal experience is Locksburg, but they covered all of the county teams, uh, you know, so they, they covered, uh, you know, DeQueen. They covered Locksburg, they covered Horatio and Gillum. You know, at that time, you know, Gillum had a, a really good basketball program. And so, but the B, you know, every every week, you know, everything was published. You know, they'd have all the, the write-up of the games and... and uh... I began in the seventh grade football and started noticing, you know, how well the paper handled everything. Uh, at one time, it was daily paper. Everything was, you know, real prompt as it could be. They ran good pictures of anything that, that happened big, not only athletics, but many other things, but of course athletics that were interesting to a lot of people. When when we started uh, playing baseball, we had a really big baseball tournament, usually in uh, July, uh, around the 4th of July, and it was a 37-team tournament, and it was the biggest in the United States. It was, uh, the 37 teams were from all over Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, uh, big towns, small towns. It was just something that everybody couldn't wait to get to this tournament to see how the, the games turned out. And it was one of the most fun things that I had an opportunity to do when I was a child. And it was always, always covered in the newspaper from top to bottom. It had tournament results, they had the bracket, everything. It was just uh, one of the nicest things that you could even imagine. JR would, uh, as I got into junior high and high school, JR was an ad advocate of, you know, football, and especially track. JR loved track. And uh, he uh, took all the notes to the track meets. And one thing I really remember well, even when I was, so when I was playing, I'll, I'll, I'll do that way. When I was playing track, he was very interested. Uh, and they always reported everything very well. And that, that was, a, the, the, the Queen Bee had always had enough stuff a person could Use, make a nice scrap, scrapbook just out of what they had. Matter of fact, I still have a, a scrapbook that my mom made uh, with uh, all the old clippings from uh, our games uh, back from when I played in junior high all the way through high school. That had been in the 1970s and early 80s. But, yeah, we uh, look forward to that. And, uh, they would always promptly, if we turned in time and they couldn't make an out-of-town game, the B was always there, ready to hear our report, and very interested, and got it published promptly. Because... A lot of people may not remember, but Walmart, well, locally, they had a, they did a little fishing contest. <laughs> it was so funny because they, they said, hey, we're, we're doing a fishing contest. And you literally would catch a fish and you could take it to Walmart. And it would be, it could be a bass or a crappie or a catfish or um, uh, I think it was a, a bluegill or there were four categories. And you literally, every week, they would uh, they say, bring us your biggest fish. And if you bring in the biggest fish, you'll win a prize. And uh, I'll never forget that because I had caught a, a crappie. <laughs> and that's a crazy story. Caught a crappie is really big. It's over three pounds. And, and I, you actually took them in the store to the back to where the sporting goods, uh, that's where it was located. You, you took your fish in there and, and they would, and if you won, you'd win like a rod and reel or tackle box or something. But they, they would publish all that in the bee. And it would be like a half page spread and all that. But yeah, I just thought that, you know, the B, it was, you know, we couldn't wait to see it. I mean, it was just something you wanted to see uh, in your name in the B or your picture in the B. But yeah. <laughs>
We were called out, uh, as I recall, it was on a Saturday night about 9 o'clock when we got the call to come to Little Rock. And, uh, so the, we had a system set up to contact our members here in town and began to gather members. And, and we left the Queen about, I don't know, it seemed like about 2 o'clock in the morning, headed for Little Rock. And we stayed up there, part of us stayed up to 60 days there at uh, Little Rock too. And, uh, the 101st Airborne had been up there, uh, and he called him back, and we stayed up there about uh, week, 10 days or something like that, and then we were under control of the governor of Arkansas at that time, which was Governor Faubus, and he was very segregated, and uh, they, they federalized this company and put us basically in the Army for the rest of the time we was up there so that it, we'd be under the Army National Control rather than under state control. Guard, I think I was 14 when I joined the National Guard. Uh, a lot of my friends joined 14 or 15. So uh, I graduated from school in May of 1957. But I got all work on that, and I had to walk home, and started home, and there's a lot of people at the armory, which at that time was down. In fact, it's part of the chicken plant now. So uh, I went down to see what was happening, and they jumped on me because I didn't have, uh, I wasn't in uniform, and I didn't have my stuff you were allowed to keep at home and that I had been federalized. So, uh, President Eisenhower and I stood federalized all of the Arkansas National Guard. People were drifting in there all night long and uh, very early in the morning, maybe even before light, we loaded into the trucks and went to Little Rock. At some later date, we got assignments, you know, usually just guard duty in front of, around the school, the perimeter of Central High School. But uh, we didn't have any trouble. Now, some prior from the 101st said they saw some trouble. We didn't see really any trouble after we got there. Not, not anything to amount to thing. Every now and then you'd see two or three boys maybe scuffling or fighting about something, but no, no violence as well. They had, see, the 101st Airborne was, was in there, it's called escorting them, you know, you follow them through the halls between class changes, met them at the front door. Uh, I, think, I think most of the crowds of protesters was gone by then. Uh, still there was some, uh, I don't know, I'd say obnoxious students. Uh, showing out in the school. Each day there's a sign that one of us to the uh, one steward, to, uh, one, one guard member to Easter, and we'd go over through the hall with them, just stay out, stand outside the room while they was in class, pick them up at, when they came out and we'd go with them. And if we went to the restroom, we stood by the door till they come out. And they, and they, yes, we by, by escorted them all the school day. But we never had any problem with them, really. Uh, some never, you never made eye contact with some of them, but some of them would, uh, were never buddy-buddy, but they always acknowledged you, you know. Uh, coming in, when they'd come in the building in the morning, well, uh, they'd either nod to you or look at you or something like that, you know. Well, back at that time, of course, we are so young. I, I don't know that we took politics quite as serious as maybe they are today. Uh, I, I don't really think I had an opinion, really. <laughs> My partner I didn't get that feeling from others that somebody said, I don't like because I'm having to do this particular thing. Uh, I thought I thought I handled it well, and like I said, I never heard one derogatory remark about doing the job. Sobering. Those people were, uh, uh, I, I consider them like heroes. The students, the, 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 the black kids, and still do. And they're all living except one now, as I understand.
still uh, a lot of people that consume their news uh, you know from newspapers and locally the bee and, and there are people that can't wait for the bee to hit the newsstands as far as our college we've always ha had a relationship with the bee always um, you know this goes back to you know when we first started marketing the college back in the 70s um, you know you'd see all kinds of write-ups uh, in the bee or our advertisements for enrollment uh, or whatever we were doing. And, and we would always make sure that, you know, the readers in the B, you know, had that. And um, uh, to make sure that we get that out because there is a, a, a very, very large contingent of, of people. I mean, that's, that's how they get their news. Uh, they like to read the paper. I mean, they still like to, you know, feel that in their hands. It's like a student in textbooks. You know, there, there are textbooks that are totally electronic, totally online. But there are a lot of students that still like to have the paper in their hands. You know, they like to feel the book. They like to turn the page. And I think that you still have a group of, uh, a large group of, you know, people that that's how they want their news. They want it where they can turn the page or they want that paper where they can sit there and have their coffee with it. And, uh, and we as a college understand that. We understand that there are a lot of different uh, marketing mediums, uh, but newspaper is still a big part of that. And the bee's a big part of that locally. Um, I've been advertising with the Queen Bee since 2012, uh, since I got into zero turn lawnmower business, and it has been very beneficial for my business. Uh, got good, good results from it, and uh, carries over into other parts of the county here, and so I get business from a pretty large radius because of that. It's, uh, much appreciated. Family's been getting the paper for, I don't know, probably as long as it's been out. My family's been here for, for many, many years, so they've had it. And then growing up, we use the paper they you know if you find out what's going on in the community and what's going on in town and who's had births and you know like the obituaries and stuff you know you can keep up with everything that's going on so basically you know and you know with the sales papers and all that with the women who like to shop they could read like this you know get all the sales papers and go through there and read, read those also and you know advertisements and all that so it just basically it, you know it puts your community and other people what's going on in D-Queen basically and that's how we used it.
when I first started there, there was a, we had what it called a bindery where we did letterheads and magazines and stuff. It's like a small print shop. And I worked in there in that department for a while before I transferred over to the newspaper part of it. Built the ads, built the pages, shot the, worked in the dark room. Like to put the plates on the press, get, got the plates ready to go on the press. Just anything he asked me to do, I did. I uh, was going to the Votec school here, Costa Votec, and Shirley Frazier uh, said Mr. Kimball needed someone to go to work for him at the B office, and that was in February in 1980. I went in for an interview, and um, I started on February the 29th, 1980, and Mr. Kimball said he gave me a three-month uh, trial basis, and um, I never was told that I was hired, so I guess I am. My husband knew the owners and introduced me, and that's how I got my job. And I did everything from A to Z. Uh, answer the phone, get the plates ready to go on the press, take the papers off the press, put them in the mail, and anything in between. <laughs> and when I graduated from school, I didn't, high school, I didn't want to go to college. And my dad and J.R. McKinley were good friends. And J.R. told him to have me come down and apply. And so I did, and I got the job. And when I started there, I was a teletype operator. I could do most of the jobs there. You know, I was kind of the uh, computer tech. I uh, kept most of that going uh, and uh, did most of the technology. I eventually learned to run the press. It was a nasty job and hard work. But, uh, you know, when we got right down to it and we had to have somebody, um, I stepped up and, and learned to do it. Uh, when I went to work at the B office, I was scheduled to my first day to be on the 17th, or I believe it was 17th of May. And um, I decided I didn't want to go to work that day, so I called to see if I could take off and start the next day. <laughs> Was I, I needed to go to Texas Cannon and buy me a cowboy hat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I was hired, I went to work putting the paper together. We did that on the light tables then with a uh, cut and paste. And we would take our, our paper and put it totally together on the light table. Then we would take it to the big camera in the big dark room. We would shoot the, the pages and to the negative, and then from the negative, we would go to the plate, and then the plate would be put onto the press to run the paper. And Mr. Kimball wanted everyone to know how to do basically everything. And once we totally learned one thing, he moved us on to something else, like doing the dark room work, um, composing ads. Um, you know, I'd come in early, seven o'clock in the morning. Um, we would uh, go through the Associated Press wire. Uh, I'd made around the courthouse, the police station, uh, sheriff's office, collected whatever news happened overnight, got back, and then the deadline was at noon. The press rolled about 12.15, and then uh, uh, it was on the streets by 12.30, 1 o'clock. Uh, we had a fleet of carriers that delivered um, the paper, uh, you know, around town and a couple rural routes out in the country. So at one time we had about 12 people working there when I started, and then that number slowly declined. But... <laughs>
I guess the probably the biggest thing that happened was in 1984. I've been here about six months. Um, we had managed to take a few days off and we're going down to the World's Fair at New Orleans. Uh, we got to Magnolia and uh, somebody called and said, you better check in. The, uh, the wreck that killed the four policemen had happened before we got there, you know, while we were on the way. Um, so that was a big event. I mean, it was a, the police department was devastated. You know, we had to figure out, the city had to figure out what to do about a police department and, and traumatic for the families. It was a terrible tragedy. Uh, probably the biggest thing. Two weeks before that, I believe, the uh, trooper Lewis Bryant had been killed by a guy on a roadside traffic stop out near the Costot River. And so the policemen that were killed were on their way to Lewis, um, uh, Lewis's funeral in Texarkana. So, you know, it was tragedy on top of tragedy. Uh, it was a, a terrible time, you know, for the city. The last Daily Citizen, I found out, was printed on May 1st, 2007. It was kind of a sad time for those of us who uh, really depended on that daily paper, but thank goodness for the weekly paper. There's just not enough advertising to support a newspaper five days a week. So probably, uh, we were the smallest daily in Arkansas, and uh, even dailies in uh, Camden, Malvern, places like that are not dailies anymore. You know, they're... They have gone to some less publication because uh, it's the same everywhere. There's just not enough advertising to support a daily newspaper. I do remember when the last daily ran. To me, that was, uh, I think, made more of an impact than when the whole press shut down. Because we just, we just couldn't see not having a daily. That not having a daily cost us money. We had, whenever there was an obituary in there, uh, people would see it. They'd order flowers. The flower shops complained that their business even went down when the daily uh, quit. The community, when they shut down the daily, was they hated it. They didn't only hate it, they decided to start another newspaper mm -hmm. and and that lasted Not a very few long. months maybe six did it even last six months i'm not sure it lasted six months but that was the feeling of the entire community well as a matter of fact we had an employee quit to go to work for that paper
did the last paper and it came off of the, the conveyor belt, it was, it was very sad for all of us because we knew that that way of life was gonna be over for us. We no longer had control of what was in the paper. If something was wrong, we could stop the press at any time and say, this needs to be redone, or this, this color isn't looking right, or this is blurry. Steiner of Winthrop was one of the men killed at Pearl Harbor. Born in 1921, Steiner grew up on the family farm and according to his obituary, sacrificed two years of school to work and support his family during the Great Depression. Definitely, uh, definitely grew up in a house where the paper was considered important, always had a subscription to it, you know, read it a lot. Uh, uh, my first job was as a paper delivery boy, um, so I guess you could say that's where maybe my first professional start in, in the newspaper industry was. The first paper that I did came out on my 21st birthday. So the, the first newspaper that, that uh, I produced as editor came out on the same day that I could legally go buy a beer afterwards to celebrate it. So, um, you know, I was a little worried because the, the town was still very much new to me. And, you know, small towns sometimes have a reputation of being very... Uh, uh, exclusive, you know, it's hard to hard to get in and and get to know people, especially a job like that where your job is to is to know things. It's like it, I never had any issues fitting in as far as what the newspaper's role was in the community. So uh, yeah, I was uh, elected as state representative for this district. Back then, this district uh, encompassed uh, Sevier and Howard counties. You know, it's all it's it's it changes. You know, every census, but uh, I represented. Um, uh, Sevier County and a, a large part, portion of Howard County. And every week in the Daily Citizen, they would always have my report. It really kind of encapsulated of what, you know, as state representative, you know, what we did the week prior, you know, what, you know, all the, the votes we made, the decisions we made, they would have quotes from us as, you know, why we made the decision we would. Um, but, you know, that would come out every week in the Daily Citizen. And, uh, and, and they, had really good coverage of, um, you know, what we did in the legislature. But. features that you see in community newspapers or your correspondence columns because um, again hey look a community newspaper has, has got limited resources doesn't have a big editorial staff like the LA Times or um, or the Washington Post would have so you have to kind of rely on this volunteer help these volunteer writers from across uh, your community and you look at a place like just specifically about Sevier County you know we've got Locksburg we got Gillum uh, we've got Paraloma way in the southeast corner. we got Horatio. Um, we've got a lot of communities here, and it would just have literally been impossible for me to, to cover those areas like they deserve to be covered. So you had, we, uh, when I first came on, we 
I think we had a correspondent for each one of those communities. Like from, from Gillum to, to Paraloma, we had folks in those communities, generally older folks who knew their community very well and they'd been doing it for a long time, who would, uh, would send in columns and, again, would cover a lot of the stuff, the events, the uh, activities um, that uh, I was just not aware of or maybe just wouldn't have time on to report myself. Um, and some of those, a lot of people will know, if you've ever looked at the old newspaper, uh, you see those columns, you know, and you might have, um, you might have uh, Miss Della down there in Paraloma talking about well, so-and-so got these many visitors on Saturday night and they didn't leave till Sunday morning. It's, 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 a, it's a type of correspondence that's just, man, it's calling the way of the dinosaur. But it was really fun if you were, like, from that community you know, you love to know exactly what was going on, you know, who got to see who, who had family come in, you know. Um, it, it just helped build that sense of community. And the loss of those, unfortunately, it's one of those things that those people will continue to do it until they pass away. And it was literally one after the other, uh, these correspondents passed away. And I just, I I feel like one of the things I really tackled that and that helped me being an outsider helped me have a different perspective was the was the Latino influence, the growing Latino influence in our community. You know, so much uh, uh, of that demographic, uh, it, it, it was built up in those early years when I was uh, editor of the newspaper. So I kind of got to chronicle that, uh, chronicle the changes, how the schools dealt with it, how city government uh, officials would deal with, you know, uh, maybe a lot of folks in the community whose English wasn't their first language and trying to incorporate them, you know, into uh, uh, assimilate them into how things were done in the city and just general life in this part of the country. So uh, that was a really exciting opportunity. And that eventually led to me founding, uh, using the newspaper to found a Spanish language uh, edition of the newspaper as well. And it wasn't just a port of the of the Queen Bee into the Spanish language, it featured very much unique stories, generally tailored uh, for the Latin, local Latino community. So that was an exciting project. Unfortunately, that didn't. After I left, it it stayed around for about a year or so, but uh, uh, it did come to an end, unfortunately, because um, at that time it was the only Sevier County locally based uh, Latino publication. There's another. The Piper has transformed a lot. When I went to work, we had eight columns, for instance, and now it's six. Um, we did everything with cut and paste. We had run it through a waxer and paste it down. And now everything's just done on a computer. We had dark rooms for pictures. We had dark rooms for the pages to be shot. We had plates and then the press. And now it goes straight from the computer to the plate, it bypasses the negatives altogether. Um, when we had our press, it was only spot color. 
we could only do spot color. And now it's full process. Um, it, there's just been a lot of changes that's taken place. Uh, you know, newspapers have, have uh, reportedly been under th threat for a long time. You know, first it was radio, then it was TV, um, and then it was the internet. And honestly, newspapers kind of weathered most of those things, uh, uh, you know, uh, as best as they could. You know, again, really relying on that on that credible, accurate reporting. But I feel like what changed so much, and I, this this happened very much during my time at the De Queen B, was was the advent of social media. People were more interested in seeing, you know, a, a two sentence post on Facebook than they were in reading, you know, a two hundred and fifty word article in a newspaper. Uh, people want, again, the attention spans were declining. People wanted um, more information in fewer words. Uh, you, you, saw, you saw a shift uh, from people's desire to, to, uh, to, to read the written word, to see videos, to see pictures, to see very short posts. Social media has really changed not just our society, it's changed our minds, I feel like, a little bit too, and our ability to, to think and look at things sometimes. Um, and, and the simple fact, too, that... It, it was a it was a new venue for content um, that directly competed with the newspaper. You know, it's the news, newspaper was great because you got to see your kid's name in the honor roll. You got to see a picture of your kid uh, getting an award. Um, you know, at high school, getting a good citizen award or something. Which you know, community p newspapers got to focus on its schools. That's one of the biggest. That's one of its biggest uh, treasure troves of information. Um, but then as schools started having. Facebook pages and uh, more and more people were getting than just specifically on Facebook. Um, you didn't need to pick up a newspaper to see your kid's picture in there anymore. Why are you going to cut out a picture of your kid in the newspaper and put it on your refrigerator when again you have a thousand photos of your kid on your phone and the local school district put that picture on its Facebook page and you get to see all the likes and comments and shares. You know, you get to see it's a lot more interactive. So. I feel like that um, it was it was social media is it, perhaps not the the death nail to newspapers, but nothing has ever uh, threatened. I feel newspapers as much as social media has. You know, what we want to do is we want to craft students who, um, that, that they, they're able to synthesize information. They're able to take in um, news from a variety of sources. They're able, to, they're able to look for and discover, well, what's the real facts inside of this? You know, where are the bias? Where is this coming from? And, um, and they're able to make thoughtful, analytical uh, decisions that are, that are based on facts. And they can sort those out because of the principles that they've learned, because of truth, because of the academic approach uh, using logic. And so I, I think that students, that's gonna serve students really well as they graduate and they go out into the world and everybody has an opinion about things that they, that they force that to go through filters and to, to make thoughtful considerations and to be able to evolve in your thinking based upon what, is, what are the facts. And that kind of leads us to why, you know, local news is important as well, because, um, you know, local newspapers allow students to begin to build a foundation for how you discern something and how you analyze something, because it's, it's, it's going to be information generally reported on with something they have more familiarity with. And so when there's a news story on a local flood, you know, or a you know, local transportation issue or 
they're like, oh, I know, I know where that road is. Oh, I know what bridge washed out. And so they have a point of reference to it, and then they can take the information and they can learn about it. And it, it becomes a great tool for helping students uh, analyze information. And so for us, uh, it's been really great, the, the, the Queen Bee, having the, the bee uh, on campus that can be used in the school um, for the students, both in the library, for students just to read and see things that's going on, and for teachers to use in the classroom as examples of analyzing information or current events that are happening. And then um, most, there's, a, there's a group of students, the most important thing is to, to hurry and get to the sports section as soon as the bee arrives on campus. joined the DeQueen Bee, it was right in the midst of newspaper offices where your big metro newspapers were shutting down left and right all across the country. This is like, we're, we're still reeling from the from the Great Recession of 08 and 09. Newspaper rooms were shutting down left and right, all the big ones, because honestly, the content that they provided was easily found in online AP articles. You know, any, um, for the most part, if you want to know what's going on in Denver or New York City or LA or Chicago, any big city, there's probably a million online resources to find that information. You don't have to go buy or pick up a newspaper. Um, but in a small town like ours, oftentimes, the, the things that are going on here are not going to be covered anywhere else except in that in that local community newspaper. That's the only way you're going to find out uh, what's going on in your community. There's literally, you know, your big uh, TV, you know, your, your city TV stations and radio stations and uh, website news and newspapers. They're not, they generally don't come to a community like ours unless there's a, something absolutely news breaking. Generally something bad is happening, you know. Uh, that's when they'll send someone down to, to cover it. So, you, the community newspaper is so important. It fills such a vital role because it does cover those things that you're just not going to see anywhere else. Now December the 15th, we had a, a, a incident involving a defendant basically fighting with an investigator. Uh, after the fight was over with, the defendant took the investigator's gun and then took the investigator's vehicle. Uh, so we had an armed suspect in a law enforcement vehicle in the northeastern part of the county. And uh, we really appreciated the Queen Bee because we contacted the Queen Bee to let the citizens know via their website, newspaper, whatever, how, their outlets that they use to let the citizens know that we had uh, ver that very problem going on in the northeastern part of the county where we had an armed suspect that didn't have a problem fighting with police. So we really felt it very important to alert the, the local population in that area that that, that kind of person is in, in the area. So uh, 
we really rely on our local media with the Queen Bee to uh, get those kind of things out. We've used them on numerous occasions for stolen vehicles. Uh, we get a lot of help from the public and uh, the link between us and the public is the D Queen Bee. And we, uh, we use them. I mean, I'm sure they don't mind us using them in that fact, but uh, we do rely on the local media groups to uh, get our message out to the people and to help us search for people and search for vehicles. And uh, we try to keep everybody abreast of what's going on. When the bee closed, I had to take the keys and drop them in the Mason's mail slot. And I'll be honest, I. I cried. Um, I'd walked in that place almost every day for 40 years. It was as much a part of me as, as anything else could be. It was, it was a very sad day. And I, I've gotten more accustomed to working from home. Um, but closing the office loop was really hard. journalism myself uh, loving newspapers it was it was awesome to be able to be uh, in charge of one and to take that opportunity to really highlight the good things that happen in our community of course you gotta you gotta report on the bad things too but that's my favorite thing was always reporting on the good things that happen in our community and something I tell a lot of people is that uh, amazing people don't just live in big cities we have amazing people all around here and i learned that so fast uh, i sealed my fate by marrying the queen girl and uh, moved to the queen and we opened up uh, our well we bought a business we bought the christian bookstore in downtown to queen then and um so I, I started i've been reading the De queen b and back then the De queen daily citizen as well um you know since for sure since 1996 um and I, uh, you know, found it to be really special that the Queen has has its own local paper. You know, unfortunately, in the the world and age we live in, uh, not many communities have their own paper anymore, and particularly not many communities our size. And so we we have something special that we have the bee. Yeah, working with the people at at the Queen Bee. Uh, it, it was it was actually it was really fantastic because there were two folks in particular, Cindy Evans, Linda Russell, who had been there like four decades at this point, or, or going on four decades. So um, it was a wealth of institutional knowledge I could rely on. I could I could I could see how things had been done for years. I think as a newspaper, um, it uh, it's got to have some consistency to it, you know. And you get somebody fresh like me, twenty one years old. You know, not from this community, jumping, hopping into that position. Um, I obviously needed a lot of help. Uh, I need a lot of institutional knowledge. So they were there to provide that. So, uh, it, it was obviously it was it was a group of people who very much cared about the product, about the newspaper, and and the and the the product uh, it produced. 
um, about the people who cared about the community, who were part of it. Um, again, I, I think that that, to me, it was the epitome of what a community newspaper should be. The highlight for me was the people that work there. My family passed away while I was really young. I wasn't even 30 yet. And these people took me in and more or less adopted me. And they were my family. They're the ones that helped me with anything I needed, from loaning me money when I needed it to just being there for me. Teaching you how to cook. And yes, there were many times uh, when I got married, I would call one of them to figure out how to cook something because I couldn't even boil water. <laughs> and they had taught me through it. So they, uh, that, that would be the highlight. You know, worked with a great bunch of people, enjoyed uh, the people that we worked with. And like I said, we worked hard. But the highlight, I think, for me, it was just being able to work for someone who cared for you as a person and not just an employee. Making the um, good friendships. Mm -hmm. um, enjoying the people that I worked with. You know, I... I... I struggle to point out one particular moment that was really a highlight uh, of my career with the Queen Bee. It was kind of, it was like a, a million little ones, you know, it was the, it was the thank yous I got for, uh, when I put a picture of someone's child in the newspaper, you know, if they were in the Christmas parade or something, get a nice shot of, of them in the, uh, in the newspaper. It was, uh, it was the stories I did on, on, um, on, uh, local veterans, you know, uh, one of the things I, I enjoyed doing was for there for a few a few years. I did a series of articles on local World War II veterans, and unfortunately, I'm, I'm certain that every single one of them that I've interviewed are now passed away. Uh, but uh, to to recreate that, to bring that history back to life, was 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 always a lot of fun. That was uh, one of my uh, definitely a highlight. Which is uh, Dick Queen's paper was probably one of the best. Uh, small newspapers in the state of Arkansas and was highly noted by uh, the state newspaper people. Uh, we had good editors and good writing. Uh, it was just an easy paper to read and it was always interesting with a variety of different articles from uh, national, which is always been important to me because I like to get a little national news throughout the paper. Uh, also local and big in sports at that point in time. That's when DeQueen really was top notch in football and this was considered a football town similar to what Nashville, Arkansas is today. So the paper was, was uh, it was just a great thing for a young man or a, even at any age to be able to sit down and read and enjoy. Um, you know, you told a story and, uh, and, and brought recognition to people who weren't maybe expecting it or never thought that they'd get any recognition. Um, yeah, I was going to say, like I said, I struggled to p pick out just one in particular, but there was just a million times where, um, where you know, you get that pat on the back and say, hey, the newspaper did a good job. You guys covered this fairly accurately, um, and you brought recognition to someone or a subject or an issue that, uh, that deserved it and would not have had it otherwise. I... Um when I went to work there, they told me I had to work there five years in order to get a two-week vacation. And I remember thinking, I'd never work here five years. And it ended up being 40 years, but I wouldn't change any of it. I loved every minute of it.